We're back on this one, folks. We are back with the next episode of the Library of Error, which is covering Chapter 4 of our good YouTube pal, Standing for Truths, published on Amazon Book, Why Human Evolution is False, The Scientific Case for Independent Origin, Has Ape to Man Evolution Been Overturned? And um, I'm, I'm quite excited to be covering today. This is, <laughs> we've got a long chapter. This is perhaps the longest chapter in this text, chapter four of five. And um, it's, golly, how many, how many is it? Let's, let's see here. Yeah, yeah, it is almost 50 pages. And we're gonna be going, we're gonna be going through the whole thing. Now, uh, the reason you might be thinking, oh, well, why, why are we going through the whole thing now? Why aren't you doing it in two parts? etc. other questions. Uh, and the reason is because I'm going out of town in a few days and I wanted to have this ready for you. Um, so even though I may not be in the side chat, you know, we're willing and ready to, to be answering questions. I plan to be very thorough so that you can kind of chat amongst yourselves as to why this uh, text continues to be problematic. And by problematic, of course, I mean wrong. So this is going to be, this is going to be a good one. I've got all the papers lined up, all the sources ready to go. Um, so let's, let's dive in. I tend to be very wishy-washy in my treatment of the text with regard to how nice or how mean I feel like being, and it's almost entirely rooted in how standing for truth is behaving. And currently, we're kind of just not on speaking terms, I suppose. He's he's trying to be civil, I suppose, with me, but uh, eh, hmm. we're we're gonna we're gonna keep things neutral to lightly mean. So, chapter four is titled "The Best Evidence for Human Evolution." I'm sure we're going to be covering some real hmm, some real winners in this one. We've now seen that many of the bones held up by ev the evolutionary community as primitive and transitional were just diseased. We're off to a stellar start right there. The bones are clear evidence of pathology. Yes, they are often atypical, but clearly diseased. Those who want to believe in ape to man evolution need to argue for their position using honest evidence, since it is now evidence that most of their prized examples are actually humans that have undergone inbreeding. Um, that's not a great sentence uh, to repeat. Those that want to believe in ape to man evolution need to argue for their position using honest evidence, since it is now evidence that most of their praised examples are actually humans that have undergone uh, inbreeding. Evident, I believe, is what he was going for. Now, now standing tends to get very... Um, irritable with me when I go over his book. And, um, you know, I mean, I'm not the one that put it in print. So when I nitpick, um, you know, like spelling errors in a book that is supposed to overturn one of the foundational cornerstones of biology, uh, it, it's because it's important if you're gonna, <laughs> if you're gonna write a text that's planning on um, reducing a paradigm to rubble, maybe have it spell checked. Um, I hear Microsoft Word does that for free. These people were not transitional, and they were not primitive. They were genetically compromised. Evolutionists think that because these bones are anomalous, they must be transitional when in fact they are riddled with pathology. How do we know this is pathology? We can see deformities in the teeth, the skull, and other body parts. The skeletal structure of these hominids are clearly human. Take a look at the hobbit. The hobbit is nothing more than a small human. These 100% human people groups are treated as subhuman. However, they are not subhuman. They are human beings suffering from pathology due to isolation and inbreeding, and in the case of the Hobbit, island dwarfism. The, pa the paleo experts are in confusion. There is no tree, just a bushy mess. Um, and then he, he cites, again, the same Eric Trinkhouse paper that we discussed in chapter one, the same one that he misrepresented then, that is still being misrepresented now um, and, uh, to show you there, uh, right there. Oops, hold on, <sighs> hold on. There it is, there it is. This one right here, wait, right here. Um, now the part that he's highlighted says, 75 documented anomalies or abnormalities from 66 individuals spanning the, ple spanning the Pleistocene 
uh, but primarily from the late Pleistocene, Middle, and Upper Paleolithic, with their more complete skeletal re remains. Um, now, I think I think the, the problem that is should be evident right off the bat is that again, this Eric Trinkhouse paper is covering late genus Homo, and the individuals that are deemed pathologic in nature in this paper are like archaic sapiens, some modern age sapiens, and Neanderthals. So appealing to this paper for like transitional species from basically say Holanthropus chidensis all the way up to Homo neanderthalensis um, isn't going to work. That's not what the text says. So you can't actually invoke this particular paper for that job. Um, but luckily, he he also invokes, it's not exactly a paper, but he invokes uh, Homo floresiensis, which he just refers to as um, the Hobbit. Now, good practice, generally speaking, when it comes to texts or, uh, or, or literature on a given subject is that you don't refer to an organism by its common name without including the nomenclature with it. So if I were standing and were to be offering him some constructive criticism, the first time you mentioned the Hobbit, you're going to want to put Homo floresiensis in parentheses right there. Um, but of course, that's not the main problem. The main problem is that this whole thing is wrong. So let's take a brief, <laughs> let's, let's take a brief, brief look at some of our papers. So let me to, let me minimize here. So looking into paleopathology, all I've done here is gone to Google Scholar and typed in paleopathology in the top. Um, and we get a whole host of different answers. Um, we get a, just a ton of sources that you can really dive and get into if you'd like. And this is because paleopathology or the study of pathology and pathologic conditions in fossil organisms is like pretty fleshed out, <laughs> which is why I find it so funny and so bold for someone like Standing for Truth, um, who is not even adjacent to this field, to say, that the hobbit, Homo floresiensis, and indeed all transitional species are riddled with pathology. Uh, he even says, how do we know this is pathology? We can see deformities in the teeth, the skull, and other body parts. Y yes, we can diagnose paleopathology and paleopathologic conditions in long dead organisms. That's how we know the transitionals aren't pathologic. We have a set of criteria from, from looking at stress, fra stress fractures and marks and muscle attachments and in bones in general um, to just the, the actual makeup of the organism. Is the bone itself warped or cracked or um, in, in other ways, you know, mechanically compromised, for lack of a better term. And this kind of leads me into our next paper which is a, the, the most recent one out, really, on Homo floresiensis as far as its phylogenetic um, placement. Uh, from 2017, June 2017. Now, I've gone over this paper before. You've seen it here. You've definitely seen this paper here uh, because creationists standing in company are just really keen on pushing this idea that Homo floresiensis, a three approximately foot tall hominin living on the island of Flores in Indonesia uh, for past 100,000 years or so, having gone extinct in 30 to 40,000 years ago, something along those lines, I believe. Um, he, they're very keen on saying that this is just a, a human. It's just, a, they're just people. They're just humans. Um, and when they say humans, they don't mean members of genus Homo. They mean anatomically modern Homo sapiens, which is, of course, not the case. Um, and the funny thing is, researchers, uh, folks who are actually in this field and do nothing all day but sit around with these bones, measuring them, analyzing them for pathologic conditions and otherwise kind of unique morphologic structures, um, they've checked that one out, right? Uh, and no, no more so is this evident than in this paper right here. In fact, boy, isn't it funny? Phylogenetic analysis with cranial, dental, and postcranial characteristics. And Standing says, we can see deformities in the teeth, dental, in the skull, cranial, um, and other body parts, postcranial characteristics. So he's, it's almost like he's referencing this paper uh, kind of, kind of t uh, off to the side. Um, but, I, you know, of course, it, it's not surprising that he doesn't bring it up because this is a very problematic paper. This, this kind of is the definitive line in, we know that Homo floresiensis isn't pathologic. So... Let's go ahead and appreciate this abstract because it's it's pretty easy to understand and 
you know, I really want to give Standing as many opportunities as possible to soak in the fact that he's incorrect on this one. Uh, that no, it, it, there is no support for him in this idea that Homo floresiensis is pathologic. Uh, very frequently he'll say something along the lines of, well, you can find a paper out there that can support you no matter what your position is. Uh, and while to a degree this can be true, that's only if you're taking the entire history of the subject into account. I mean, you can you can find papers that support alchemy, technically, if you go back far enough into, like, whatever the, the 1600s works, I suppose, rather than papers. Um, but, you know, at the time, they were subject to a very primitive form of peer review. Other folks who were into alchemy eyeballed them. Uh, the, the point being, yes, but <laughs> there's a reason why... While consensus is important, consensus based on sound methodology is the most important bit, right? There's this whole idea that there's a fly on my webcam and might walk in front of it. I'm sorry if you are subject to that. Um, but there's a reason why consensus tends to change less and less as our measurements and methods get more precise, because we're able to rule out more error. So, you know, this is why we typically go with the more recent, assuming, you know, the methods are sound, which we'll see here, they, they're they very comprehensive. Uh, we tend to go with the most recent analyses. So, let's appreciate the abstract. Although the diminutive Homo floresiensis has been known for a decade, its phylogenetic status remains highly contentious. A broad range of potential explanations for the evolution of this species has been explored. One view is that Homo floresiensis is derived from Asian Homo erectus that arrived on Flores and subsequently evolved a smaller body size, perhaps due to the, to survive perhaps sorry to survive the constrained resources they faced in the new island environment. Fossil remains of Homo erectus, well known from Java, have not yet been discovered on Flores. The second hypothesis is that Homo floresiensis is directly descended from an early Homo lineage with roots in Africa, such as Homo habilis. And the third is that Homo sapiens uh, with pathology is the best explanation. We use parsimony and Bayesian phylogenetic methods in order to test our hypothesis. Our phylogenetic data build upon these characteristics previously presented, this is really important, we stand on the shoulders of giants, in support of these hypotheses by broadening the range of traits to include the crania, mandibles, dentition, and postcrania of Homo and Australopithecus. The new data and analyses support the hypothesis that Homo floresiensis is an early Homo lineage. Homo floresiensis is sister either to Homo habilis alone or to a clade consisting of at least Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo ergaster, and Homo sapiens. A close phylogenetic relationship between Homo floresiensis and Homo erectus or Homo sapiens can be rejected. Furthermore, most of the traits separating Homo floresiensis from Homo sapiens are not readily attributable to pathology e.g. Down syndrome. The results suggest that Homo floresiensis is a long-surviving relict of early uh, 1.75 million years ago homo hominin lineage and hitherto unknown migration out of Africa and not a recent derivative of either Homo erectus or Homo sapiens. So that's a wrap. This, this hominin is not pathologic and it's also not kind of the, um, not been begetted by uh, Homo erectus or Homo sapiens, um, at least not according to this paper, which the most important part of this paper, in my opinion, that I think is very important for, for individuals like standing to understand, is that it used its building, rather, upon characters previously presented in support of these hypotheses. So this paper isn't ignoring those who supported pathology back in 2008 or whatever. Uh, I think it was actually earlier than that. Um, but rather, it's taking that information and incorporating it into the analysis with more data. This means with the maximum amount of data, right, which is what you're always supposed to do to perform a robust analysis, you can definitively reject pathology for Homo floresiensis. Okay, that's, that's just, that's it. So, you know, if, if someone like Standing for Truth wishes to propose that this is still something that should be on the table, what he needs to do is take this paper and go through it and explain why the characterization of the potential for pathology or for that matter the descendants from something like homo erectus or homo sapiens can and should be rejected um and that's that's kind of it for for the pathology so let's let's continue here <laughs> We know there exist two separate groups. These groups are either ape, australopithecines, or human. Eh, all right, we're going to need a source for that one, big guy. Uh, Standing for Truth has been to date 
incapable of presenting a set of criteria that can accurately distinguish uh, homo hominins from australopithecine hominins or paranthropine hominins for that matter. Um, and that's a challenge that I've presented to him and kind of his company many times. If you're going to say that these are readily distinguishable, why can't you present the set of characteristics that distinguish them? If it's so obvious, as they so frequently and boldly assert, it should be a piece of cake. But it's not. It's not even easy for the individuals who are big into biological anthropology, the folks with the PhDs, who sit out there, again, and measure these by to the millimeter, right? Very minute measurements, precise measurements across multiple different specimens. And they argue about where to place certain hominids. You know, some people will say that Homo habilis should be an Australopithecine. Some will say that Australopithecus sediba should be in genus Homo. Uh, and therein lies the problem. If the professionals have trouble defining this very blurry gradient, almost like evolution is a continuous process, what makes anyone think that standing for truth and raw mat can without a background in the subject? Uh, which is why it's not surprising that they don't present their set of criteria because they don't have them. Now, Stanley, feel free to prove me wrong. Publish a video that says, here's the set of criteria. Boom, it's right there. Um, and I know you haven't done this already other than that, that really, um, frankly, embarrassing thing that Raw Matt published that I made a video of, a um, two-part video of a while back. Um, you're gonna have to do better than that. You can see my comments on that in those videos. It, that, for reasons I outlined there, those criteria don't work. So you have to try again. You have to reject the, the hypothesis and try again. Um, and, and this isn't like, a, oh, that, that's just your opinion, man. It's like I backed, I backed my, my statements up with like literature. So you have to do the same if you want to actually be taken seriously on this. This is very useful in explaining to people the facts. Is there a bridge from ape to man? Is there a series of transitions that are irrefutable enough that we have no choice to believe in human, human evolution? The answer is an obvious no. The evidence in the fossil record supports biblical creation and separate ancestry. There is no clear transition from ape to man. Uh, citation needed, my friend. Uh, of course, he, he doesn't do that. <laughs> we don't get any of that. Uh, fortunately, in appendix, once it was this appendix B, appendix 2, we will get to do missing links revisited by Raw Madden standing for truth, which is going to be quite fun. Uh, because as we all know, Raw Matt is the epitome of no thoughts, head empty. In this important chapter, we thoroughly refute the best evidence for human evolution. So the spoiler alert is that in this chapter, there is no paleontology. So I don't know that we're refuting the best evidence. Many lines of evidence against, or many lines of evidence the apologists of human evolution will look to are simply agnostic to the creation versus evolution debate, since both models can explain the data. These lines of evidence that are neutral to the debate include homologous patterns and nested hierarchical patterns in anatomy and genetics. We will begin by examining the claims of the evolutionists by focusing on homology and nested hierarchies, then ERVs and retrotransposons. You'll notice that this chapter spends a significant amount of time on DNA function. Experts in evolution are well aware that in order to maintain human evolution as a valid idea, they have to convince the public that the genome consists mostly of evolutionary leftovers, gen genomic fossils, and fossil DNA. I make certain the reader finishes this chapter knowing very well the entire junk DNA paradigm has been overturned. I challenge the proponent of evolution and universal common ancestry to refute the arguments and evidence presented in this chapter and this entire book standing. My guy, you got it. Deal, what do you say? Now, we're gonna be talking about the junk DNA stuff in a little bit, but <laughs> we, need to, we need to set something abundantly straight here because Nested hierarchies and homology are not agnostic. If they were, creationists wouldn't have fought them tooth and nail for the past century and a half. You won't find a paper prior to, or an article, since Christians don't really publish legitimate papers that often, uh, you won't find anything, any literature prior to probably 2008, I would even say 2010, that is written by a creationist that is even neutral to the idea of nested hierarchies, homology, and to extend that outward transitional species. They just outright say that these things don't exist and have been doing so 
again for like a century and a half. It has been a very recent tactic by the likes of Nathaniel Jensen to say, ah, no, 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 no. Uh, creation can explain that evidence as well. And it's important to appreciate that it's not about accommodating the evidence. It's not just about that. If you've got two hypotheses, one is evolutionary theory and one is creationism. And evolution says a century and a half ago, say, you know what? Um, homologies, nested hierarchies, and transitional species, this is something that we should find if evolution is indeed correct. Creation, on the other hand, said, nope, we won't find them. Nice try, it's not gonna happen. Wipe our hands of that. Checkmate evo idiots, or whatever they're, whatever John Maddox is memeing about these days. Um, and then, lo and behold, we find homology, we find nested hierarchies, we find transitional species. So you can think of that as a negative prediction for creationism and a positive prediction for evolutionary theory. And I say a positive prediction, it's really hundreds of thousands of predictions that have come to fruition in various lineages. And that's not exactly agnostic takes, right? It isn't until 2010 that creationism finally says, holy shit. This is really here, and we have to do something with it. So they changed the model to accommodate the evidence. Accommodation is not the same thing as testable, accurate predictions, which as Standing for Truth says multiple times in this very text, is the gold standard of science. So no, these things are not agnostic to this discussion. Not when your side, quote unquote, as small and irrelevant as it may be, has been saying that these aspects of science don't exist, they just aren't real for decades and decades and decades. So, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna you can try to push that as much as you want, but that's that's not gonna hold. Everyone knows that creationism like has been dragged, kicking and screaming into the 2010s to appreciate the nature of transitional species and homology and nested hierarchies. So let us continue. I suspect, once again, they will resort to rescue devices. He cribbed rescue devices, by the way, again, just to remind everybody from replacing Darwin, and paleo experts comes from contested bones, both of which are just high cringe. We will also have a look at the human chromosome 2 fusion. This is just a brief overview of what should be expected in this human evolution demolishing chapter. This chapter will be more than comprehensive and sufficient enough for any serious creationist to utilize in discussion and debate. Good, I'm excited, but I've already read it, and it is not those things. It is a fact that humans and chimpanzees share much in common when it comes to anatomy and genetics. Should this really surprise anyone? If we were to pre pretend DNA sequencing technology did, did not exist, it would still be apparent that we share many similarities with the great apes. Yes, creationist father of taxonomy Carl Linnaeus recognized this. He famously said, this is the paraphrasing, but I can provide a link in the description, and I can think of no reason to separate man from simian or simian from man, lest I bring all of the theologians upon me. Um, maybe I ought to by virtue, virtue of the discipline. So he's basically saying, look, I can't think of any reason why to not, why not to include humans with the rest of the apes, but I really don't want to piss off the other creationists, so I guess we'll just go ahead and do it. Um, Without ever looking at the DNA of humans and chimpanzees, we would easily conclude that we share so much in common just by looking at appearance. We are both mammals. I put good. <laughs> That's good. We share similarities in basic body structure, both have binocular vision. Similarities in anatomy, physiology, and genetics can either be explained by a common designer or a common ancestor. This is true, kind of, because the example, the way that he's actually about to kind of describe this, it creates a lot of issues. <laughs> you ready? The Chevy Malibu and the Honda Accord show numerous similarities. They both have a windshield in the, in the front and doors on the side. They're both sedans with a certain height from the ground and feature many countless features such as sound systems, heated seating, navigation systems, backup camera, etc. Human engineers built on homologous patterns because it works. A common design for a common purpose. Proponents of evolution seem to only want to focus on the similarity. Yes, let us talk about the differences, but first it's important to uh, appreciate and point out that you can't use car similarities as analogous for nested hierarchies. The reason common design doesn't work as an appropriate counter is because design doesn't have heritable traits. Like, there is no mating in design. There is no mating and a trace of um, 
crossing over altered genetics and shared genomes among closely related cars, so to speak, um, you could perhaps argue that the blueprints act as the DNA. You could say, look, these two cars have very similar blueprints. Uh, they're just made by the same designer. It, it's not like it was common descent. And I would say, yes, okay, sure, that, that does work. But the problem comes when these guys will look at two very similar genomes and they'll say, okay, well, these are separate, these are examples of, of um, separate design. And they'll do that for like humans and chimps. But then they'll look at two very similar genomes and say, no, these are the same and they're for two different humans. Where's the line? Where does a similar genome change from being common ancestry, as in humans, uh, Neanderthals, or even a father and a son, versus common design? How can you distinguish the two? Hold on just a sec, I'm gonna grab a water here. So he continues onward. He says, look at the differences in human and ape feet, for example. This would be analogous to saying, look at the difference between dog and canid feet, for example. The great apes have feet that resemble hands, and this structure is beneficial for grasping purposes and for swinging, for swinging from trees. Human feet are built for upright walking. Once again, without even looking at the DNA, we can easily tell that there will be several similarities based on outward appearance. As biblical creationists, we are constantly asked the questions, why are humans so like the chimpanzee? Why are humans more like the chimpanzee than they are to a dog or a fish? It is expected that we would share more in terms of DNA similarity with the chimpanzee than we would a whale or a dog, or for the same reason we share more in terms of anatomy and physiology with the chimpanzee. We are more similar in anatomy and physiology to the great apes than we are to a fish, and so we should have more similarities genetically. This should not be a surprise to the evolutionist, nor should it surprise a biblical creationist. These degrees of similarity in no way, shape, or form demonstrate that humans are related to the great apes. Homology is agnostic to this debate. So there are a couple of things that I find very interesting here. First is this kind of emphasis that eyeballing something is good enough, right? You, know, you can eyeball it, look at it. You can just look at them and see that they're similar in some ways and different than others. Um, but the problem is, again, the reason why design doesn't work in the same way that evolutionary theory does is because design doesn't incorporate principles of heredity. So yes, humans and chimpanzees are built very similarly. We have many of the same features. And for that reason, you would expect there to be a certain level of similarity because we are indeed built the same way, and in the same way that a blueprint for uh, two different skyscrapers might look very similar um, when you're looking at kind of the bones of it, the bare bones of it. But the problem again is that common design can't account for like lineages, right? So humans and chimps share a whole lot of DNA based off of just what makes us up, but we also share heritable elements. So elements that can only be passed on through heritability. And creationists, again, will be quite fine with saying, well, all of the great apes are in the same group. And when you say, well, why are they in the same group? They'll say, well, look at their genetics. They share a lot of these transposable elements, for example, and they look the same. But the second you take humans into account, bearing in mind that humans share more genetically with chimpanzees than either species does to gorillas, then all of a sudden it starts to be, well, come on, we need to appreciate the differences. So let's take a moment to appreciate hominin feet or rather, in this case, we're looking at hominid feet. So these are <laughs> the feet, right, of Homo sapiens, Pantroglodytes, Gorilla Gorilla, and Pongo Pygmaeus. Now these individuals are, are hominids, right? So humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. Now of these, you'll notice that all are kind of unique. In the human's case, the big toe, the halix, is in line with the rest of the digits. In the case of the chimpanzee, it jets out to the side. In the case of the gorilla, it jets out to the side less than in the chimp, almost more like the human, but it is indeed curved, right? It doesn't bear the same straight posture that human and chimp hind feet do. And perhaps, arguably, the most divergent of these hind feet is that of the orangutan, whose thumb is dwarfed compared to the halixes of the other organisms, and whose fingers are far more curved. Now, if you look at this, anybody who knows anything about like anatomy and physiology and locomotion can look at these feet without knowing what the animals are that they belong to, and then they could say, I suppose we're talking to some kind of alien paleontologist. They would be able to say that this organism is going to be a biped, or at least it's going to be bearing a lot of weight on these feet because it's got this strong inline halix for transferring weight. 
they would look at the chimpanzee and the gorilla and they would say, well, you know, they've got these nice opposable thumbs for, for grasping and clasping, but they're not spending as much time on the ground as this individual is. Um, and then they would look at the orangutan and they would say, well, this individual is very clearly spending more time in the trees than any of these other ones because its hind foot is almost exclusively built for grasping. So this individual is spending all its time in the trees being an arboreal suspensory locomotor or brachiator. So they're swinging around by their arms and they're grabbing things and doing a lot of clamoring. These two individuals spend a lot of time on the ground with gorillas spending more time on the ground than chimpanzees. You can tell because their halix is almost more in line. Um, and then chimpanzees and homo sapiens both spend the majority of their time on the ground, but chimps are spending more time in the trees. They're capable of getting up and down in trees, while humans are more adapted for savanna life. And because chimps and humans have more in common genetically, uh, what we know is that these two split more recently. And they probably, out of these this group here, these two are probably the ones that share the most in common with this rigid halix. Um, and less curved fingers in comparison to these other two organisms here, gorillas and orangutans. So, you know, you, you want to say, look at the feet. Yes, well, yes, let's. Let us eyeball it. Let us see kind of where we get. Uh, this, is a, this is kind of a fun picture too, primate feet. This is just their, their actual feet. And we see the diversity from baboons and siamangs versus, you know, this is a circopithecoid, of course. Siamangs are like gibbons. The human foot, chimps, gorillas, and orangutans, they're all very different because they're all adapted to very specific environments. Now, perhaps most important um, is this right here. So this is the uh, foot of a, just like a classic arboreal quadruped. And then we've got Artipithecus rabidus, who still has this jetting out halix. Um, and then you've got SW573. Now this is, I, I want to say that this is Littlefoot. Um, STW573. Let's double check. 573. Is this Littlefoot? Yes. What species is Littlefoot? Right. So this is, this organism right here is one of our Australopithecines. And you'll notice that the halix is indeed in line. Now you'll of, you'll of course run into creationists that, that have a problem with this. They'll point to this particular fossil and they'll say, well, you know, it's just not what we think it is. Uh, they won't elaborate further than that, uh, mind you. Um, but the thinking is that this is significantly more in line than any of the other previous like hominins we've seen in human evolution. And this makes sense because chronologically, this is going to come prior to the emergence of genus Homo. So, you know, the reason why we look like these animals genetically, why would, why do we have their heritable elements? Um, is because we do indeed descend from them. Um, we share a common ancestor with the extant ones and we indeed descend from the very ancient ones. And the way that we know that this is common descent and not common design is because we have heritable elements from these guys that don't do anything, as far as we know, in our functional genome. Now, we're going to be talking about functional genomes here in a little bit, but that's when you're faced with, with the creationist on this, there is a difference between descent and design. Descent necessitates heredity, and heredity can't have lines drawn in it. What I mean by this is that Creationists, of course, just like conventional scientists, do indeed accept a degree of speciation. But speciation is kind of arbitrary. It's very difficult to tell where one species begins and, um, and, and where that line is drawn with its extant begetting population. So if you have a population of, of yellow newts, right, and they're breeding and they're doing their thing and some of the newts end up uh, in a new environment that favors orange newts over yellow ones. And so yellow newts tend to be favored. You know, obviously they're born with, with natural variation and the ones that are closer to orange are less likely to be picked off by predators and so they stick around. Um, there isn't going to be a way genetically to look at these two where you can definitively say when, you've, when you're looking at these, in this case we're in kind of like a ring species situation, yellow newts end and orange newts begin. And that same issue exists with like humans and the rest of the apes. There is no way to categorize humans as separate without creating very narrow classifications and creating hundreds of thousands of species to fit on your arc. So let's continue. Here we get another lovely reference to his other book, which is just awesome. 
On pages 43 to 44 in Universal Ancestry or Separate Ancestry, the biblical model of origins made easy, it is indicated that evolutionists often point to nested hierarchies as the number one best evidence for evolution. Um, and then he basically goes through nested hierarchies. I want to point out this one, we, you know, we already talked about nested hierarchies and why, indeed, these, this kind of support, this kind of data is not agnostic. Creationists don't think it is, or haven't at least until the past 10 years. This speaks volumes. Um, I find it very funny because Standing for Truth says here, this means that nested hierarchies in DNA, anatomy, and physiology are also predicted by creationists based on the design model. This simply isn't the case. What happened is creationists accommodated their creationism model in order to account for nested hierarchies. That is not the same thing as a prediction, and it's very, very disheartening and worrisome that Standing for Truth either thinks that it is, that those two things can be compared, or that he knows better. Because the way that science works is you set out with a prediction. A hypothesis that, I suppose, you start with a hypothesis that then you can make predictions on, is a better way of putting it. Then you collect data, then you analyze your data, and then you either reject or accept your hypothesis. And if you reject it, you alter your experiment or you alter your hypothesis and move on. Um, so, no, creationism never predicted this. It merely accommodates it in its design form. And even then, because of the nature of heredity and heredity, her, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, heritable elements, it really doesn't even do that. Critics of biblical creation assume God's design. They believe God should have made humans 100% distinct from the rest of biology. Does this make any logical sense? Kind of. <laughs> if you're going to assume that humans are indeed unique and assert that they're unique, would it not make sense to have that be evident in their design? Uh, DNA is the information code that makes life. The Bible does not imply in any way that we should see humans as equally separate and in terms of anatomical and, <clears throat> excuse me, and genetic similarity with the rest of the biological world. So then isn't it strange that these individuals, creationists, seem to rail so hard against being apes? Now, I know for a fact that the author of this book, Standing for Truth, accepts that humans are apes, uh, which is a good step. I always like to bring that up because it's such a good step and I'm very proud of him for making it. I, that's actually no sarcasm there. I, I'm, I'm happy that step has been made. For this to be the case, would God have had, he, he just like speculates on how, he just, ex, he speculates on how God could have done it, how atheists or like people who don't believe in creationism would propose God should do it. Um, I mean, it, theoretically, like from the standpoint of what we see theologically, it does indeed seem that God is claiming humans are special. As far as I'm concerned, um, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I understand, I suppose I should say it's late here. As far as I understand, being made in God's image is, is like a spiritual prospect, not a physical one. So none of this really matters anyways. But, you know, if you're going to take the stance that humans are special, then I would imagine that that should carry over to their design, should it not? <laughs> then he says, The proponent of evolution, if honest, must admit there is no reason why we should not expect nested hierarchies in the biological world. Well, I mean, evolution predicted nested hierarchies. I put, don't turn it around, because I was like, this is absurd. Um, crafty, but absurd. Nested hierarchies are simply a characteristic of design. No, they're not. According to biblical, the biblical model, we ex would expect more similarities anatomically between humans and chips than between a human and a dog. Um, I don't know that you can say according to the biblical model. The biblical model makes no real claims about anything scientific. Um, you can take claims from the Bible and force fit it into a model, uh, or, or try to interpret models based off of what you presume the Bible is trying to say, but then you run into issues with interpretation. Whose interpretation is correct? Well, that's a whole different bag of worms, but we're just here to talk about the science. As indicated, okay, God, he's just talking about design models again. Um, he's talking about how cars and design, transportation hierarchies, he calls them. Um, yeah, and then he's got like a bunch of pictures of like cars and stuff like that. Again, this doesn't work because cars don't breed. They don't have information crossover. You can force them into a hierarchy, but because heredity is not at play, it's, it's a false equivalency. Um, so it doesn't, it just doesn't really matter. And, and like, he's been told this before. He, he, he doesn't care. So cha standing, a, a challenge for you. Um, once you're done with my other questions, explain to me how 
creationists predicted nested hierarchies, predicted, not accommodated, predicted, provide for me a source that shows that they did indeed predict, um, and then explain to me a better way of illustrating your point that takes into account the nature of uh, sexual reproduction and heredity, because that's why common descent is a more robust hypothesis. Your, your, mod your example using cars doesn't account for that. So it is the inferior explanation just from that standpoint as well. Okay, nested hierarchical patterns are simply a hallmark of design. I'm saying the same stuff again. Um, I'm, I also am just not going to read this whole book to you. As much as I know you would love to hear uh, a, a creationist novella, um, I suppose you might call this, given its length, Although novella, I think, implies fiction. Pamphlet, maybe? Small text. In my, my very, my very non-grading, non-high-pitched voice. Okay. Yeah, he says, These groups within groups patterns we see in the biological world are predicted by both models. No, they're not. Therefore, no honest proponent of human evolution can use these patterns as evidence for human evolution over biblical creation and separate ancestry. I put, come on, SFT. I put, man, come on, SFT. You can't, you you can't just do the job that you did on this and then like put that forward with the confidence that you do. It's misplaced. Uh, then he has a, a cartoon that he cribbed from Answers in Genesis. Um, Specialists in the field of human evolution and genetics will often say, oh, I'm excited about this one, will often say without hesitation that humans and chimpanzees are genetically similar by about 96 to 99 percent. Is this true? I put yes. <laughs> Uh, therefore, if this present simil percent similarity, oh sorry, uh, first, irrespective of the percent similarity, a hierarchy does exist. Therefore, if this percent similarity is true or not, this hierarchy exists. That's a really well-structured sentence. This means humans are more like chimpanzees and the other great apes than they are to old world monkeys. Humans are more like great apes and the old world monkeys than they are to dogs and fish. This hierarchy is without question, but let us investigate the claim made by the evolutionary community regarding DNA similarity. Shall we? Yes, we shall, standing for truth, because I'm very excited to talk about the hack of Jeffrey Tompkins, who you, who you parade around so confidently in this text. Um, Jeffrey Tompkins, who was uh, promptly, promptly chastised for his use of a bugged blast system by someone who's not even involved in biology, Glenn Williamson, an excellent computer dude, a programmer, I think he is, um, but who's not, like, he basically just looked at what Tompkins did. Tompkins, being someone who is involved in biology, he didn't know he was using a bug version of his own program. So there, therein lies the first issue. But we'll get to the rest in a bit. Researchers ignore much of the data when analyzing the portions of the chimpanzee and human genomes. It's not as cut and dry as experts would like us to believe. For example, instead of dealing with some problematic questions concerning major portions of the chimp and human genomes, researchers have omitted sizable mismatched sections. This would consist of over 1 billion letters. A letter-by-letter -letter comparison on the remaining 2 billion letters did reveal over 98% similarity. And so yes, we do share 98 to 99% of our genetics with chimpanzees. But this is if we overlook 18% and 20%, 25% of ours. I think he meant to say 18% of theirs and 25% um, of ours. I put JFC, uh, and there you can see the sentence structure, is indeed uh, what I just read out loud. Um, like an editor's not that expensive, I don't think. I think a, a good friend, Sandy's got a large enough channel at this point. I, you would think he would be able to get a pal to like eyeball this. I hope, I, I hope that, you know, I grabbed this edition right when it came out. I hope his second edition has been published and is not full of so many, like, grammar, grammarical, grammarical, grammaric? Grammar and spelling errors. Again, it's quite late here. <laughs> I guess who am I to talk if I'm stumbling over my words? Um, Jeffrey Tompkins has done significant work on determining the actual similarity of the genetics of humans and chimpanzees. As I pointed out, there are whole chunks of DNA not found in either humans or chimpanzees. Researchers are comparing roughly 2.2 billion of our actual total letters. The total amount of letters in the human and chimpanzee genomes is roughly 3 billion letters. The type of DNA change experts in the field are looking at are single nucleotide polymorphisms. So A to T or G to C, for instance. Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins' main point all along is that when you include single letter differences, the chunk differences, and the big chunks that are missing, you end up with 88% similarity. Where do we get the 96 to 99? Well, within that 88%, you could find between 96 and 99% identity. 
when you break it down, it is that it is quite simple. And so if you include everything, we see that there are upwards of around 300 million DNA differences. And that is a lot. He proposes without, <laughs> he proposes without elaboration. There is no way for that amount of differences to arise in the time frame. Experts in the field of human evolution say there is since the human chimpanzee split. He asserts without data. There exists a massive waiting time problem. He asserts, once again, without sources. This is yet another final blow, fatal blow to human evolution, and we have barely gotten started. So I think that it's important to like discuss this Jeffrey Tompkins thing. Because Jeffrey Tompkins is, um, he's kind of a dingus. And the reason I say that he's kind of a dingus is because this man, again, he used a bugged version of Blast um, initially, and that's when he was going around touting the 70% number between humans and chimps. Then he revised it to this newer number. And I think that we should go through that because our lovely friend, um, Ruhith, the guy who I was telling you caught Jeffrey Tompkins the first time with this issue with a bugged version of Blast, uh, has helped us out here. I uh, pulled up his video here where he kind of discusses um, uh, the problem, the issue, and he's looking at Tompkins' paper. So let me show you which paper he's using so that you can go about and find it for yourself if need be. Uh, comparison of 1800 de novo assembled, or 18,000, my mistake, de novo assembled chimpanzee uh, context to the human genome. Yields average blast in alignment identities of 84%. So you may be wondering, why does that say 84% and why does Standing's text here say 84% in the picture, uh, but, but then he says 88% later? And the answer is I'm not sure because I'm not 100% certain that Jeffrey Tompkins is like f using that 88%, like I don't think he's quoted as using 88%, uh, but I suppose we should check that out real quick. Are you ready for a really fun rabbit hole? So I googled, <laughs> I just went ahead and googled Jeffrey Tompkins 88% similarity humans and chimps and the first thing that pops up is of course a uh, Dr. Weil blog. We, we do love, uh, we love Weil. Weil is fun. And he essentially is just praising the heck out of, um, out of Jeffrey Tompkins for this new 88% study. And he notes too that like, okay, we're definitely using um, a non-bugged version of BLAST. As a result, Dr. Tompkins redid his study using the one version of BLAST that did not contain the bug. His results are shown above. Um, and then he presents these results, which show, oh, look, along all the chromosomes with human percent uh, similarity, they all seem to be at or below 90%, most of them below. So, hmm, what's well, that, golly, that looks a lot like 88%, doesn't it? And of course, here's Jeffrey Tompkins over here, uh, kind of down a little bit, discussing it more in depth on AnswersInGenesis.com, which you can check for yourself. And then I thought to myself, hmm, 2015, eh? Oh boy, that sure is strange. Because the one that Ruhith is looking at is from 2018. And this one suggests 84%, and it's on very specific aspects of the genome, it appears, um, rather than what he had done previously. So this is, the, hmm, this is kind of strange, right? Initially I was like, well, that's, that's quite odd. And I scrolled down a bit more, and I see Uncommon Descent, which, as you'll see momentarily, is an ID website. So intelligent design. And as I'm reading it, I notice that the author of this intelligent, <clears throat> excuse me, design blog from 2015, again, so the, none of this is the same as what was going on over here. This is something entirely different. So Standing is indeed, he's discussing the work by Jeffrey Tompkins and in the same, in the same paragraph, he's discussing the 88% similarity um, and he's, or not in the same paragraph, rather, on the same page, he's discussing the 88 similarity, 88% 88 similarity, and the 84% picture. So I'm not 100% sure why he chose to do that, but let's investigate both, because I think that that would be thorough. So this is really fun. This is an intelligent design blog titled Uncommon Descent, uh, serving the intelligent design community. And they have this fun little blog titled Human and Chimp DNA, they really are about 98% similar. 
um, they start by kind of dunking on uh, Dr. Weil and recapping the entire situation where Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins abandoned his claim humans and chimps are only 70% Similar in favor of a revised figure of 88%, but even that figure is too low according to the man who spotted the original flaw in Tompkins work. So once again, that's this guy, Ruhif, over here, who, who has been doing the legwork on uh, dunking on Jeffrey Tompkins' poor methodology for the past several years. We'll come to this in a moment. So he talks about what Dr. Weil uh, mentioned, and we already kind of went over that, where he goes over how excellent Tonkin's new work is. And then Glenn Williamson kind of <laughs> swoops in, that's Ruhif, and he swoops in and kind of discusses it a little bit. And as he continues onward, he decides to get into it a bit more. So what was wrong with Tomkin's new study? I'll let Glenn Williamson explain. Now, this is after, of course, the previous update of the story, which is in an update at the top of his post, Dr. Weil now admits to having cold feet, even about a revised 88% figure. Based on the comments below by Glenn, uh, Glenn Williamson, there are questions regarding the analysis used by Dr. Tompkins' study upon which this article is based. Until Dr. Tompkins addresses these questions, it is best to be skeptical of his 88% similarity figure. Uh, so this is very funny to me because Weigel was the one who came out guns blazing for Tompkins, and then he's like, ooh, <laughs> my man done screwed up again. That's what seems to have happened here with, with our pal uh, Jeffrey Tompkins. So how did he screw it up this time? The first time he used the bad bugged blast, but what did he do this time? Well, Ruhif lays it out for us. He says, as I've laid out many times, this is the way that Tompkins did the study. If there is a single base pair indel in the middle of a 300 base pair sequence, Tompkins will say this is a 50% match. Tompkins is most certainly aware of this, yet he chose to publish it, and I think that says pretty much everything. Um, so I hope it's evident why that's problematic, but let's let's go ahead and let's let me go ahead and illustrate it a little bit better. Suppose we have a, a sequence. I wonder if I could do it on here. I'll just do it. Um, let's, let's try Google. <laughs> this is going to be kind of a funny way to do it. Google Translate. Okay, so suppose we have a sequence A, T, T, A, G, C, C, A. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight letters, right? Um, if Tompkins were looking at a sequence of DNA, this particular string of base pairs, and this is the chimp, and then this is the human, A, T, T, A, and then let's say there's an insertion, right? We get C, and then everything is shifted. G, C, C, A. So this guy got inserted right in the middle here, and then it continues on its way. Tompkins would consider all of this a similar, right? Because this is matched with the G and that with the C and that with like this this would screw up the entire situation in Tompkins eyes. These would not be um in this case like let's say we use 10 letters instead. They wouldn't be 90% similar because only one letter is different and everything is shifted. Uh they would be 50% similar uh because only the first half is identical. So that doesn't, that doesn't really work. <laughs> that's not really how uh, any of this works. And that's why he says that there's a single base pair indel in the middle of a 300 base pair sequence, Tompkins will say it's a 50% match. Um, another commenter, Ace of Spades, I believe Ace of Spades is from the Reddit days. The obvious thing that Tompkins hasn't done with his blast analysis I talk about here, there are few cases in which no match will be found because the entire sequence appears de novo in chimpanzees as a result of a single mutation, or because humans have a large deletion which other primates don't. Deletions like this also occurred in a single mutation. Tompkins would count both of these as being a 0% match, or 600 effective mutations if the sequence he was searching for was 300 base pairs each. In reality, this represents two mutations. So, you know, 300 times too many. So, the author of this blog, an ID friendly blog, an ID promoting blog, says, I'll let Glenn Williamson have the final word. If you're comparing two 300 base pair sequences and one of those sequences has a single indel smack bang in the middle, Tompkins counts it as 50% identical. 
I've told him twice he cannot use ungapped and then calculate the result this way. He can only do one of two things. Use ungapped, which ignores indels, and therefore he can only report the substitution rate, or allow gaps, and or allow gaps, and this is what he fails to mention in his paper, get a result of 96.9%, because Glenn did the calculations himself. And this is using a very conservative method of calculation as well, since it counts a 50 base pair indel as having the same weight as a 50 as 50 individual mutations. If you counted 50 base pair indels as a single event, which it probably was, the overall results would be pushed towards 98%, which is a figure usually thrown around anyways. So <laughs> And in a comment later on, let's see, titled Chimp and Human DNA versus Sophisticated Nonsense, um, we find that Tompkins, I've actually written a paper on Tompkins' 70% result, um, and attempted to get it published in the Answers Research Journal. Obviously, they're not having a bar of it. Tompkins, the sole peer reviewer, and he's currently refusing to provide any critique of my work. This is insane. This is why, and for those creationists who I, I do know that some of you watch my videos this is why people don't submit to the answers research journal this is why when you're like if you have a problem with Jensen's work submit to the answers research journal your critiques Tompkins is one of the reviewers sorry the sole peer reviewer and he won't review them so take it up with your flock guys um now, thankfully, Tompkins' latest article in the Answers Research Journal, this is at the time of 2015, acknowledges Williamson's work in a single sentence. However, in 2014, he talks about using a bug um, and personal communication. So, you know, as a so a submitted article only counts as personal communication. Perhaps Dr. Tompkins needs to be a little more upfront about giving credit where credit is due and acknowledging his mistakes. At any rate, the ball is in his court, and his latest 88% similarity figure warrants skepticism. I have to say that Dr. Tompkins' methodology sounds rather suspicious to me. I concur on common dissent and uh, VJ Torley. This is indeed very suspicious. So you can catch the, this paper. Um, I've, it's pretty easy to find the original human and chimp comparison and uh, like chimp genome sequencing. Uh, this I wanted to talk about as well, because another thing that before we move to the next bit, one thing Standing for Truth mentioned that um, a lot of creationists tend to mention is this idea that the human and chimp genomes are only 98, sorry, 96 uh, to 99% similar if you're comparing uh, if you're overlooking 18% of theirs and 25% of ours. There is a portion of that that is due to the fact that the genomes are different sizes. You, you can't compare uh, aspects that are different sizes necessarily. You can only compare the, the matched portions and see, excuse me, how they kind of line up. But the other issue with this is that neither the human or the chimp genome have been completely sequenced. In fact, no mammal genome has been completely sequenced in the sense that we've hashed out every single letter, um, which is covered in this 2017 article um, covered by Craig Venter. Um, it's fair to say the human genome was never fully sequenced, Craig Venter um, told Stat. The human genome has not been completely sequenced and neither has any other mammalian genome as far as I'm aware, which is true. Now that was by George Church, not um, Venter. And uh, they discussed down here the reason. It's difficult, it's, it's between difficult or impossible to do if the chunks, um, the, the bits that haven't been sequenced, contain a lot of repetitive elements, such as TTA, um, blah, 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 uh, or TTAATA -A 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 three times. The problem is when you have the exact same words, it's hard to assemble, said Lander, just as if a jigsaw uh, puzzle pieces show the exact same blue sky. So the point of the matter is that the bits that aren't sequenced aren't sequenced because they lack a function as far as we are aware. Um, we know that the human genome is not 100% functional, we'll get to that later, um, which it serves to reason that if we know it's not 100% functional and these bits aren't doing anything, they're not showing in function, that they're probably non-functional. And they're essentially these little short tandem repeats um, that are very, like, repetitive. I just said short tandem repeats. Again, it's late year. But as I said in my previous video, <laughs> it's looking like the more that we analyze, because there are people pushing that we, we just go ahead full throttle and do the whole thing, that the, that the human chimp similarity is going to continue to rise. Um, which is interesting. I don't know. I don't know how that's... I mean, it, it would have to be by tiny, tiny percentages, since, you know, there's only very small portions, really, of the, of the human and chimp genomes that 
aren't actually um, sequenced. It's not actually this 18 and 25 percent because some of that is due to the fact that the genomes are different sizes. Um, and different sizes are something that's pretty normal. Genomes do different sizes. Um, that you, if memory serves, there are human populations who are vastly genetically different, obviously still humans, whose genomes are different sizes. It, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. It just means that they're different sizes. Usually it's in these areas um, of useless junk DNA that kind of get chopped off. But let's continue. Let us uh, consider for a moment Tomkin's most recent work from 2018, where he talks about the de novo ooh, context to the human genome. Now, he comes up with this 84%, which is funny. And Ruhif kind of gets into the weeds as to why this is kind of kind of bonkers. I mean, I know I know this should come as like no surprise, but Tompkins isn't awesome at like genetics, which is kind of not that great since I'm pretty sure he's a plant geneticist. Let's let's double check. Jeffrey Tompkins plant geneticist. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Plant science and genetics. So his PhD is in general genetics. He does plant genetics, so we should probably specify that. Is this ever going to load, do you guys think? There it is. Uh, similarity. Winner. So here's what Tompkins did this time. This column is the percentage identity. So this is actually the uh, the the identity of similarity between two different sections of DNA. So you've got a human section and a chimp section, and you line them up and you get this percent similarity, uh, which is 97.596%. And then for the next section, you get 69%, nice, and then 80, 79, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he comes up with this 84.39% total. There's just one problem. This isn't weighted correctly. The, the math isn't done appropriately. He's treating all of these query lengths as if they are equally important, despite the fact that all of these enormous portions down here, where we've got 98, 98, 98, 98, 97, 98, 98, 97, 98, 98, are all a million to two million to almost three million base pairs in length, whereas these 66 are 1,000 in length, and um, that's not great. Ruhif kind of outlines the problem with this, with this math equation here. He says he takes his car out last week. First he drives from Sydney to Melbourne. That's a long time, 8 hours and 49 minutes, um, and it's about 1,748 kilometers, and uses 174.8 liters of fuel. So he gets a fuel efficiency that's 10 liters for every 100 kilometers, or 23.5 miles per the gallon. Uh, and then the next day, he drives again, and he takes his car to the local supermarket. He drives two kilometers, uses 0.2, or sorry, 0.32 liters of fuel, and his fuel efficiency uh, is much less excellent at 16 liters per 1,000, or sorry, 100 kilometers, or 14.7 miles to the gallon. Now, he points out that Tompkins isn't really doing his math correctly because if we were to actually try to find out what the overall fuel efficiency was, this is what that equation would look like, right? This is how everything would be weighted based off of distance. He puts a little check mark there. But what Tompkins does is effectively weight everything equally, which isn't right because Eight hours and 49 minutes and 1,748 kilometers should not be weighted the same as two kilometers and um, 0.32 liters of fuel, um, taking a much shorter period of time because you're just going down the road. And he puts wrong. <laughs> this is what Tompkins has done. I'll put this link in the description so you can kind of get a better idea. So what I'm trying to say here is Jeffrey Tompkins is an inept geneticist. He's had three chances to do this. The first time he came up with the 70%, he was using a bugged version of BLAST. Then, in 2015, he fixes everything, gets 88% similarity, comes to find out that he is not actually calculating it correctly because he's counting 50% similarity for a single indel, 
which only shifts things. That, that's not how identity works. That's not how comparative genomics works. That's not how it works in humans when we're trying to find out paternity. That's not how it works when we're doing animal breeding or things of that nature either. It's not correct. And then of course, here is this last time where he gets an 84% or 84.39% here in the year of our Lord 2018. And this time he doesn't weight his numbers correctly. How grand. This guy doesn't know what he's doing and standing for truth is using him as an authority figure. So again, to quote our friend at um, the Intelligent Design blog, uh, Uncommon Descent, it does indeed seem that humans and chimps are 98 to 99% similar. Case closed. So let's, oh, oh, sorry Tompkins, it's not our fault that you're bad at your job. So I was getting my water and it occurred to me that we're like halfway through this and this is already an hour. So I'm going to break this into two parts. Chapter four of the Library of Error is going to be in two parts. Yay for you! And since this is uh, this makes things easier on me because I'm just going to keep recording, then I'll have two videos to release while I'm gone, which is going to be, wow, great. It's going to be awesome. And so my gentle and modern apes, that's going to do it. And I'll see you in a bit. Take care of yourselves.